Oh, I will I will kick off. So, hello everybody. Uh, I think probably there'll be others joining us as as we proceed. Um, but anyway, let's let's get started. So, this is um, well, this is kind of the the big presentation of of our our five years of Mingaloo Outlook uh, research. So, uh, we kicked off in in two thousand and fifteen. We ran for, for five years. Um, we, ran, we did during that time around about 30 expeditions up to Ningaloo, research expeditions of various kinds. Some of them involved sitting on a beach during the night. Some of them involved uh, going out on the water, uh, doing various bits and pieces. A few dozen researchers and then many, many participants from Exmouth. So today is all about you up in Exmouth. Now, Normally, we'd come to you. That's, that was our plan all along. Uh, we wanted to come up, present our, our research results and, and the other findings to you, have a drink with you, have a, have a chat with you, uh, but we can't. Uh, the, the Queenslanders aren't allowed into WA and those of us who are down in Perth aren't, aren't uh, allowed up in Exmouth. So we're doing things a little bit differently this time. Uh, so bear with us. We're we're trying to make it work as best we can, but we're all kind of sitting in our various living rooms or basements or wherever we are. So uh, we'll, we'll try and make it work. Um, but um, bear with us if we do have a few technical issues. We're going to share our screens and and show some some research to you. So sit back, relax, uh, have have your beverage of choice for this time of day. Uh, I think we are recording. Uh, Joe Nod or Mark Nod if we are recording. So if anybody does miss it, then uh, there'll be a link to the recording as well. So we're going to have a, the running order is uh, Damien will present on the reef research. I'll talk about the turtle research. Then uh, Rich, our anchor, will bring us home and, and uh, I won't tell you about what he's going to talk about. It's a big surprise. Um, now, at the end of that, we're going to have a, a bit of a question and answer session down the bottom of your screen. Uh, if your screen's like mine, you've got a few sort of buttons that you can press. We're gonna use the chat button, right, Mark? Not if I'm, I'm using the right one. So post your, post your question, something like this. Question, something like that, and then we will go from there. We'll compile the questions and and run them. So that's enough from me. Uh, we're we each got about eight or so minutes to talk. So that'll be about uh, half an hour, and then we can open it up, type the questions in, and then we'll field them and distribute them around. So uh, over to Damien to kick off. Thanks very much, Matt. I'll just test. So can everyone see my screen? Yep, thanks, Damien. Yep. All good? Oh, great. Okay, so yes, my name's Damien Thompson. Welcome all. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm a little bit of a novice to this uh, webinar thing. So um, yeah, please forgive me if I prove how much of a numpy I am. Um, so, yeah, I've been very fortunate. We've had a great team to work on the Shallow Reef Program. And, uh, yeah, those people are listed there below. And today I'm just going to give a summary of uh, the status of corals, fish and debris. So these are really sort of just highlights of some of the work over the last five years. And if there's anything you'd like more details on, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me or have a look at the, uh, the web links that are throughout the presentation. Okay, so preaching to the converted here, but we know that Ningaloo shallow reefs are important. Uh, culturally, there's a long history of indigenous use. Uh, recreationally, they're important for things like beachside camping, boating, as well as you know, snorkeling, kite boarding and uh, fishing. It's estimated there's more than 50,000 visitors a year to that northern section of Ningaloo. And Ningaloo is also very important scientifically. It's a unique fringing reef system, which has been relatively unaffected by global climate change to date. 
In fact, it's one of the few World Heritage listed coral reefs predicted to avoid severe bleaching more than twice per decade by 2040. And that's due in part due to the uh, reef's close proximity to um, cooler, deeper water and the uh, waves that drive that cooler water up over the reef. <clears throat> so at the start of the program, we sat down with um, a bunch of people and tried to work out what some of the knowledge gaps were for the shallow reefs. And these are three of the gaps that we came up with, um, providing information on the status of corals and fish in understudied habitats. So that's typically the reef slope. We can see from the background image there that the reef slope is a very extensive habitat spatially, uh, and yet most of the work that had been done at Ningaloo prior to 2015 had concentrated on that reef flat area or inshore area. So there was relatively uh, little information available for the reef slope. Climate change, uh, like all coral reefs around the world, um, Ningaloo is not immune. Um, so we wanted to look at uh, the risk for things such as sea level rise for Ningaloo. And then also rubbish. Uh, there's been some great work that's been done in the last 10 years, um, often by uh, volunteer groups, looking at uh, rubbish levels on the shorelines. But we wanted to have a good look and see what was actually on the reef. So the backbone of our work are these annual surveys. Um, they're structured, they happen uh, about this time of year usually. And as part of those surveys, we survey fish using standard underwater visual sensors techniques. Uh, we survey what's on the sea floor using three-dimensional habitat models and photo transects and macro debris uh, we survey visually. So the map here on the right shows the location of the 70 to 75 odd um, sites that we try to target each year. And over the five years, we've surveyed more than 45 kilometres of reef and seven kilometres of shoreline. So what we've uh, been able to provide is these annual level assessments of things such as biomass of target fish groups. So this plot here shows us the biomass of one of the target fish groups, the left rhinids. So that includes the spangos. And although we don't see any strong trend over the last five years in this group, uh, this data is being fed into longer term studies, which are identifying, for example, long term declines in restricted areas on the reef flat at Nandu in some of these target species. And uh, also um, even longer term declines in, in some other groups. Similarly, with uh, hard corals, um, we're extending existing data sets and providing new data on the understudied reef slope area. So this plot here just shows us the changes in percent cover, mean percent cover in the three main habitats. And unlike fish, uh, we actually saw quite strong trends in uh, coral cover, particularly uh, on the reef slope, where it was uh, increasing uh, over the last five years. And so that was a pleasing, pleasing discovery. And debris. Um, we ran visual surveys for debris on the reef while we were doing the uh, coral and fish surveys. Uh, we know debris accumulation in the marine environment is a worldwide problem. Um, but we were very pleased to note that uh, Ningaloo has some of the lowest levels of debris recorded on any coral reef in the world. So uh, the plot here sort of shows density of debris in the different regions over the five years. And although it's quite variable, uh, that averaged out to less than one item per hectare in the water and less than 10 to 15 items per hectare on the beaches. So that's something like 500 times lower than on um, some coral reefs around the world. So the, the trend that I mentioned earlier, the increase in percent cover of hard corals on the reef slope, we wanted to better understand what was driving those increases over the last five years. So we used a range of traditional techniques in combination with um, uh, some of the newer techniques. And this is an example here of one of the diver collecting overlapping images on the reef slope. Um, and then that, those images are fed into uh, structure from motion photogrammetry software. And it enables you to create these three dimensional maps of the sea floor. And these maps are particularly valuable because 
they actually provide really good, well, they provide 100% coverage of fairly large areas of the reef when we compare these to traditional photo belt transects. And so we're able to use these maps to have a look at things such as coral growth. So these, these are images taken from those three dimensional uh, maps. And what it allows us to do is to track the growth and also the death of individual colonies over time. So these three maps are separated uh, by a year and uh, you can see, you can track individual colonies and the change in the uh, two dimensional area of those colonies. And so the results from this are really quite interesting. So this is a summary of the uh, three dominant coral types on the reef slope. We have the relatively flat a proper on the left here, the massive bloody gyre in the middle, and the bushy or sort of branching, anastomized branching uh, Stylopher and Seriatopora on the right. And so what we saw is growth rates, which are shown by the white bars, the Acropora and the Stylophora and Seriatopora grew relatively quickly at between three and three and a half centimetres uh, radial increase per year. In contrast, the massives as expected were much slower growing. Um, we found that the smaller corals of all three types tended to grow faster than larger individual colonies and that all corals tended to grow faster in areas where there was less wave energy. And this data also showed us that around about 80% of all coral, of corals of these three types survived each year. So that's the first time we've been able to provide this data from these understudied habitats. And it's quite pleasing, it indicates that the increases in coral cover that we've seen over the last five years uh, likely to be mainly due to the growth of existing colonies rather than recruitment of new colonies. So this information is also being fed into our, what we call our calcification budget. So this is essentially the balance between predicted rates of reef growth um, contributed to by the growth of things such as corals and crustose coral and algae minus the erosion of calcium carbonate, which is eroded by biological um, agents such as the urchins and the parrotfish, as well as physical processes. And what we've found is that um, preliminary uh, predictions suggest that although Ningaloo is actually very well positioned on a global scale to keep pace with things such as sea level rise, um, anything more than a moderate increase in sea level rise, um, so a prediction at, aligned with RCP 4.5, anything more than that, and uh, there is a suggestion that um, the rate of vertical reef growth um, might, might not be sufficient to keep pace with sea level rise. So that has um, large implications for things like the amount of energy coming in over the reef and reaching the shoreline and impacting things such as teal nesting habitat. Okay, so just in conclusion, yeah, we found the trends in corals and fish were quite different across the three major habitats over the last five years. Uh, fish abundances were highly variable over this period. Uh, coral cover was generally increasing on the reef flat and the reef slope due mostly to an increase in the size of existing corals. And we observed very low levels of debris and uh, what debris was there tended to be in areas of high human use. And finally, this is where we would be at this time of year if it was a COVID-free world. So um, yeah, every now and again, I just remind myself by uh, having a look at these images, what a wonderful place uh, Ningaloo is. And certainly um, if there are locals online tonight, uh, yeah, you're very, very fortunate. Um, Cause uh, yeah, us uh, Perthites and uh, those further afield can't get, it, can't get up there at the moment. So uh, we look on with envy. Okay, so I just want to say a big thank you to um, EX Mount School, the teachers and the students there, uh, the local businesses that support us uh, in this work, and also colleagues at DBCA and uh, friends that have helped us with from the Cape Conservation Group and Reef Check. And also a big thanks to the, um, the wider Ningaloo Outlook, Outlook Partnership. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks, Damien. And you almost, Stephen, snuck into your 10-minute limit there, so not bad. All right, I'll take over from here. 
and share my screen without further ado. Now, is that all good? Looks like that's sharing okay. So I'm going to talk about turtles. Uh, not a big surprise. So what are we doing up at Ningaloo about turtles? Or what did we do, I should say, up in Ningaloo about turtles? Well, we tried to set out to uh, answer a few questions. Um, three kind of broad questions, roughly how many are there? Where are they going? What, what are they doing? Um, where are they spending their time? What food sources are they relying on? We didn't get too far with number one. We're still working on that one. Um, but we did make some pretty good progress with, with two and three. So that's what I'll talk about today. So in terms of finding out where they were going, we used a lot of satellite tagging. So we kind of can think of that as split up into two different types of turtle, if you like. So during the day, we got the boat, we went out into Mangrove Bay mostly, and we caught turtles in the water using this method called rodeo, which basically means you, you jump on them and you wrangle them into the boat. The, the N is just a sort of a scientific shorthand for number. So that's 24 turtles that we got in Mangrove Bay. And then uh, we also went out at night looking for turtles who were nesting. Once they'd finished nesting or, or if they decided not to, we'd, we'd sort of restrain them, put a tag on. So we got 13 of those. And uh, many of you were heavily involved in, in one or both of those activities, even, even to the point of uh, going from sunrise to, sorry, sunset to sunrise. So that's what we found. So our, our color coded, I should say on, on this side, green means that we caught them in the water, red means that we got them on the beach. So the ones that we got in the water over here on the right hand side, our green turtles, they basically didn't wander very far at all. So, you know, the furthest any of them wandered was 21 kilometers. I'll show you that one in a minute, but almost all of them really hung around here and moved less than five kilometers. In fact, the average distance between the first location that they transmitted and the last location that they transmitted before the tag died was less than a kilometer. So they really are homebodies. Versus the nesting turtles, who once they'd finished nesting, went all over the shop. So we have a thousand kilometers, actually more than 1200 kilometers all the way up into the Kimberley, a whole bunch through the, through the Pilbara, some as far down as Shark Bay. So roughly half of them left the World Heritage Area completely. And of that half, they were kind of evenly split between the ones that went north and the ones that went south. Then I mentioned there was one that did, one of our resident turtles, our in-water catchers that did go a bit further. Uh, we did get that tag back. So thanks to the secret person who found it and managed to return it through, through Danny. I, I, I don't know who that person is, but I definitely owe them a beer at least. Uh, and this is, that was from a turtle called Oliver. This is what Oliver did. Oliver was caught here as a young male turtle and then spent a few weeks around Mangrove Bay, moved around into the Gulf and when, when in fact the Gulf was quite cool and then stayed around in this area here. And we know from other work that we've done, that's, a, that's quite a decent seagrass meadow through there. So Oliver knew where he was going, moved down, spent all his time on the seagrass meadow. And, and then in fact, just before his transmitter died, he moved back to Mangrove Bay. So that's the ones that live in Ningaloo and then the ones that nest at Ningaloo. But uh, we wanted to know where the turtles that live in Ningaloo nest. So to do that, many of you will have seen this contraption. We used a portable ultrasound and we went out in the water, caught large female turtles that we hoped might be nesting. And we were looking for these kind of golf ball shaped images. We found three turtles like that over the space of two years of searching. And I can show you the tracks of two of them. One of them went all the way up to 80 mile beach, a distance of 800 kilometers. Then the tag failed before she came back. But these two, we got the full round trip. So one of them in green went all the way up to the Monte Bellows, followed it almost the same track down back to Mangrove Bay. Then one of them in the brownie color 
sort of wandered out, did a couple of loop-de-loops, ended up up here on the top of Barrow Island around John Wayne Beach, and then found a much direct, much more direct route back. So the turtles that nest at Ningaloo are coming from everywhere from the Kimberley to Shark Bay, but the turtles that live at Ningaloo look like they are going elsewhere to nest. And so far of the three that we've found, plus a few uh, flipper tags, it does look like there's a large proportion of them go and nest uh, in the Pilbara. Then those of you who came out and saw what we were doing noticed that we were collecting a lot of samples, some, some various blood samples, some biopsies of the hind flipper, and then we did a, did a little bit, little bit of um, <clears throat> uh, cut a few nail clippings off the turtles. Well, we were doing that to take them back to the lab and, and analyze the chemicals in them to really look at what they were doing with diet. So the punchline for that looks a little bit like this. So here's our, here's our mangrove bay. There's quite a buffet out there for turtles in mangrove bay, but broadly we've got right in close to shore, there's a bunch of seagrass and then in the lagoon and closer out to the reach, there was a bunch of seaweed. Well, as it turns out that the little ones are eating seagrass and they're hanging around right in close in Mangrove Bay by and large. The bigger ones are eating seaweed and they're moving out into the lagoon. So that's, a, that's sort of a movement of around about one and a half kilometers, sometimes two kilometers on, on average. So what we've got is, um, you know, nesting migrations of hundreds to thousands of kilometers over the space of weeks but then over the space of decades during their life at Mangrove Bay, they're moving only a kilometre or so. So they really are homebodies uh, when they are at home in Mangrove Bay. So the punchlines, once again, the, the resident ones that aren't nesting, they aren't leaving Ningaloo except when they do go and nest. It says next there should be nest. And then uh, the nesting females originate from a really wide area they change diet and their sort of their home range, if you like, as they grow. Um, that's basically moving from right in close to outside in the lagoon. And really I've mentioned a few times that the community participation has been really central to that. So that's all about thanking you. Um, we couldn't have done this without you. There's, there's many of you on the call who have been really central to this, um, who have basically spent many, many hours sitting in the sun or, or sitting on the beach in the dark. Um, so thank you. I owe you all a drink. There's a few other people that um, I probably should mention spe um, specifically that have been really helpful. Susie's been a, a rock um, and the sort of the, the engagement, the, the photos that we've shown there, the, the sort of the participation of the school has been a highlight every year. And then Pete and Danny, um, Danny took over from Keeley as the sort of the turtle coordinator um, and they've been fantastic. So thank you to you all. Thank you to the whole Ningaloo Outlook team and in fact, the, the whole partnership. So that is that from me. I, I think I snuck in my time okay. So I will now hand over to Richard. Enough suspense. What are you gonna talk about, Richard? Can everybody hear me? Yes. Excellent. Thanks, Matt. Um, that's good how you promised everyone a drink when you're not there, but um, I know you have deep pockets, so I'm sure everyone can look forward to a cool beverage when you are up there. Including uh, Jess, who found the tag, who's listening in, which is exciting. All right, so I'm going to talk about the mysterious movements of whale sharks. Uh, we did do a bunch of work on reef sharks as well, but um, seeing as I have trouble getting what I have to say in the allotted time, I thought I'd stick to one species instead of five. Um, also, I'd like to acknowledge my CSIRO co-workers. Um, they've put in an awesome amount of effort in the field and in the lab to, to make this happen. So I guess along the same lines as Matt, um, we're interested in, in things like how many there are, where do they spend their time, and what food resources do they like, do they rely on? Um, so for how many there are for whale sharks, we're looking at tissue samples and genetics, a close skin mark recapture to, to try and find out what the population size is. That works ongoing. Um, and Richie, I can't see your screen. Do you want to double check that you're right. sharing your screen? Me. Sure. 
How's that? Much better. You see that now? Yep. All good? All good. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so how many there are, where do they spend their time and what food resources do they rely on? So we use uh, tissue sampling and genetics. The talk I'll talk about tonight is gonna to focus mainly on the tagging. So where do they spend their time and where do they go? Uh, for the whale sharks, we haven't really looked at what they eat in terms of isotopes because it's really tricky as you'll see because they move around so much. But we can infer where they, where they eat and where they stop based on the satellite tags and also the, the depth data that we get back from those tags. But most of the focus of today's talk will be about some of the, some of the more bizarre movements that we've observed um, with the satellite tags. So this is just a video of the procedure. Once we find a shark, we take some photographs of it, we measure it with stereo video, and then we take a little genetic sample with a biopsy plug, which is about to happen now. Most of the time the sharks are swimming on the surface. This one's being a bit unobliging, it's about 10 meters down. Um, and now the satellite tag, which is a towed satellite tag, is going in. Um, and the satellite tags will stay in from anywhere between sort of three to, to 12 months is as long as we've had. Obviously, the longer they stay in, the better. So all up, we've tagged 40 whale sharks since 2015, about 10 a year since the project started. Um, we stopped tagging in 2018. And all the dots and crosses basically represent the the locations from all the satellite tags from the, from the various years. So there's a lot of variability between the individuals that we've tagged. There doesn't seem to be any specific patterns in terms of males or females or big males or big females or small, small animals. They're pretty much just doing their own sort of thing. Um, but there's obviously some hot spots along that, along that Northwest shelf. Um, and one of the ways we can look and try and interpret animal movement is to look at something that we call home range. And this is where they spend the majority of their time. Either broken down to say whether they spend 50% of their time or 95% of their time. And we take all those satellite detections and, and run them through a model that basically gives us a probability of where they might be in, in as we'll see in each month's, month of the year um, from those satellite detections. So the next slides are basically gonna show you each month um, and where the sharks, the, the highest probability is where the sharks are likely to be. So we can see in June, which is generally when we do our work, most of the sharks are concentrated around uh, Ningaloo with a few up towards the Montes um, and Barrow Island. And then as we go into July, animals start to disperse a lot more widely um, out into the Indian Ocean and the, and the sort of Arafura and Timor Seas. Come August, we've got animals as far away um, as, as Roti near, near West Papua, as well as up towards Cocos Keeling and, and Java, Indonesia. And they sort of seem to get further and further away through September, October. You can see one animal there is in the Gulf of Carpentaria. And then come November, animals start to sort of retract a bit closer back towards the Australian mainland and start to move a bit south. And the hotspot shifts from more off Ningaloo down towards Shark Bay and Bernier and Dora Island. And in December, we've had three animals down off Perth. Um, and it's interesting, all those animals are out off the shelf in, in deep water rather than on the sort of the slope, which is where we normally find them. January again, a couple of different hotspots. What we can see is come March, animals start to, to come back to Ningaloo. Um, obviously, we lose tags as we go through, through the time. So we have less data for March and April than, than we like. And that's something that we can work on. But basically the pattern is they, they spread out and then they sort of contract back to Ningaloo um, where the aggregation site is. So if we look at their home range over the entire period or the entire year, we can see that it's a massive home range. So we've got animals spanning up to 600,000 kilometres, which is, is an enormous home range. And it's obviously really difficult to manage a species on that scale that's crossing international boundaries and borders are moving around so much. Um, so that's one of the challenges globally with, with whale sharks. And what we're hoping to do in the future is to, to look at the connectivity between the, the Ningaloo population and other populations around the world um, through, through close kin marker capture, which will give us population estimates as well as whether animals, say from Ningaloo, share a parent um, over, the, over the 
years with animals in, in India or, or Africa or, or even in the, in, the, in the Pacific Oceans. So one of the interesting sharks that we had was a shark called Roger, about a five and a half, six metre male shark. It was named after Roger Swainson in one of our naming poles. Um, <clears throat> Roger moved from, from Ningaloo, hung around a bit, and then ended up in the Gulf of Carpentaria. And basically, over a couple of months, he swam more than 3,000 kilometres uh, into the Gulf. And from, from when he left the, the Rolly Shoals to when he arrived in the, <coughs> in the Gulf was about, about a month, and it was about 2,500 kilometres, which is an average of 3.5 kilometres an hour. Um, and it's a really directed movement. So clearly this shark sort of knew where it was going or has been there before or something is, is telling it that it wants to, that it, that it should go there. Because this is not a random event. This is clearly a targeted, I'm going to go there and I'm going to go there now and I'm going to swim as fast as I can, which isn't very fast for a whale shark, um, until it gets there. So why the Gulf of Carpentaria? One theory is the Gulf's a really productive place. So this is a map of zooplankton biomass, red and, and yellow is high biomass, blue is really low biomass. So the Gulf's a really productive spot. Um, and we know from, from previous um, information from charter fishermen that whale sharks are actually quite common in the Gulf. Um, these are some images taken in October and November from, from last year of whale sharks approaching boats in the Gulf. Um, and so, Although it's the first time we've documented it, it's obviously not the first time it's, it's happened. Um, I'm not sure if any of you saw this. There was a whale shark that turned up. This is Weeper in the Gulf of Carpentaria. Um, there's, a, there's a good heading there, Raid of the Lost Shark. Um, so basically this shark turned up in an estuary um, in Weeper. And when we zoom in, so this is Weeper, that's the Embley River to the south. Um, so that's, this is where the whale shark was first seen. Um, and so it's a mangrove environment. It's about 40 kilometers from the mouth of the river. Here's a photo of the shark swimming in a muddy, muddy mangrove lined bank. Um, the only thing missing is a crocodile, but I can guarantee you there are crocodiles up there. I've spent a lot of time up there. Um, and basically the shark was trapped or allegedly trapped in the small Reacher River. Now it could have got out at high tide <clears throat> throughout the period that it was trapped, but it, Apparently, it was just swimming backwards and forwards in this one little spot. And we, we don't know why it was there. Um, there were various calls to try and remove it. Um, it was there for, for several weeks. And in the end, um, it, it, it disappeared and, and it wasn't seen again. Um, so again, this is where it was first seen on the 1st of September. And unfortunately, it was seen about three months later um, in another river system to the north. Um, it's obviously not alive anymore. Um, I tried to get people to get me tissue samples, but that was about as close as anyone was willing to get. Apparently it was quite smelly, um, but we did work with the Department of, of Environment in Queensland and we were able to get some tissue samples while the animal was alive. And this will enable us to, to, to see if this is one of the sharks from, from Ningaloo, which is I guess the most probable scenario. And if indeed it's one of the sharks that, that we've seen um, or work with in the, in the past. Um, so we still don't know really what happened to the shark. Was it sick when it went there? Did it get trapped? Was the water too hot? Um, is the Gulf of Carpentaria a, a, a place where whale sharks go to die? Um, probably not, but I guess it highlights the fact that we, you know, there's so many behaviors <clears throat> that are unique to these animals that we just don't understand. Um, and this work's really important in, in trying to address some of the knowledge gaps that we have. So that sums things up. I'd, yeah, just like to thank Belinda, Steph, and Brian for all the, the work they they put in behind the scenes, and Joe Myers, of course, and uh, and the wonderful team at DBCA. You can see that's an old slide, um, and also colleagues in Weeper, uh, Josh and Wade, and and our wonderful pilot Tiff. And that's all from me. Thanks, Rich. Bang on 10 minutes as well. Nice work. Um, so we now have 20, 25 minutes or so that we can try and field some questions. Uh, I haven't 
seen any. I'm just look, I'm just opening them up now. Um, looks looks unusually uh, unusually quiet. Um, some of you are, are usually not that shy, Michelle, for example. Um, so throw the questions in. Um, but while you're thinking of your, your questions, I'm going to throw one to, to Damien in the first instance. Um, Damo, you, you showed that uh, plot uh, where coral was, was increasing. Um, so how do you, I mean, what's the reason for the coral to be increasing at Ningaloo and, and how do you kind of figure that, you know, in a world where coral's kind of declining everywhere else? Yeah, no, that's right, Matt. I mean, you know, one of the things we have to accept with that um, total coral cover metric is it's a fairly crude uh, estimate of um, abundance. And in some cases it's used for health as well. But, you know, the conditions at Ningaloo in the last five years have been fairly conducive to um, good coral growth. You know, we haven't seen any significant heating events. Um, we haven't seen any uh, really bad cyclones um, to, and they certainly haven't hit that west coast so you know we haven't um, we haven't experienced a, a significant um, impact to the, the coral communities over that period and, and so what we're seeing is probably a pretty natural recovery trajectory um, and that's one of the things we're doing now we're actually having a look at individual locations and seeing if the recovery trajectory for these different uh, individual sites are varied, and if so, what's driving the different recovery trajectories of those sites? So, you probably um, recall a presentation from the, uh, Anna Creswell, PhD student, and she had done a, a much larger scale analysis looking at um, what happens on coral reefs when corals do recover, and she came up with five um, recovery trajectories that um, seem to be replicated throughout the world. So we're currently applying those to individual locations to see if we can get a better understanding of what's happening um, at a smaller scale. Cool, thanks, Damo. Um, so a few questions coming in now. So questions about turtles from Julie and, and from Tony. There's a question in the Q&A box from, from Grace. So we'll, we'll try to, to get to all of those. Um, uh, question from Julie, did you, did you tag many male turtles? Uh, Julie, we, we tag some, not, not a lot. Um, one of the interesting ones that we tagged, which was right in, in the beginning, in the, in the first day, was uh, in, in the first couple of days, was a, was a big old male turtle we called, we called Jeff. Uh, Jeff was caught in, in Mangrove Bay and, and essentially hang around Mangrove Bay. We tracked him for uh, pretty much spot on a year. And the only time Jeff left Mangrove Bay, in fact, the only time Jeff left a very small part of Mangrove Bay was was during mating season where he did a run which lasted for about six or seven days and he went up to to the beach at graveyards and obviously graveyards is a is a mating beach and uh, he spent his six seven days with the with the fellas up at up at gravies and then went back down to, to mangrove bay uh, but we don't have a lot of information about male turtles Tony, uh, Tony's question about whether there's been a noticeable increase in nesting. Uh, I wish I knew, Tony. I I'm stuck down in Perth. I haven't I haven't been up, um, and I I haven't yet seen any information from the Ningaloo Turtle Program. Uh, but uh, maybe if there's someone that does know the answer to that online, um, we can get an answer. So. Uh, Grace, got your question there. I know Dave. I know uh, Brian's going to have a brief mention about that one at the end. Um, so I might, I might go back to that one, and instead I'll pick up the question, the next question in line, which is from Julie, uh, probably to to Damo, which is uh, if acroporids decline at Ningaloo, do you think other coral texts might increase, Damo? Yes, I just uh, replied online there, but that's a great question. I mean, there's some evidence that 
what we called uncommon coral genera. So that was uh, coral genera that constituted less than 10% of the coral assemblage. There's some evidence that they are actually increasing on the reef slope. Um, but the patterns or the trends in what we call common genera were similar to common genera on the reef flat area. Um, so it depends on which area of the reef we're talking about as to um, the correct answer to that question. All right. Thanks, Damo. Um, so Michelle chimes in and says there has been a decrease in turtle nesting this year. So that's, that's news to me. Thanks, Michelle. Um, and Richard reminds me that we've got a bunch of acoustic tag, tag uh, data for, for males, which, which tells the same story uh, as Jeff. They essentially, they're, they're home bodies and, and don't move much at all, except when it comes time to go up to the mating beaches like gravies. Um, any other questions? I'm just scanning, scanning the webinar chat. Um, Rich, the home range whale shark data is so interesting. There you go. It was it was worth the suspense, apparently. So, well, um, while we're waiting for some of those other questions to come in, Brian, did you want to pick up on, on Grace's question that was in the, in the Q&A box? Yeah, no, certainly. Uh, thanks, Matt. I've got a question for you as well. Um, so maybe I can tie the two together. Um, certainly, um, EHP is certainly a proud partner in the, the work that's been done through the Nigula Outlook project. And um, we are currently working with CSRO to see what future research priorities look like and, and how these could be delivered. So. I'll leave the answer there um, to that particular question. Uh, and I guess one thing I'm interested, certainly Matt, is um, from the research that has been done and some of the new technologies that have been identified through the research over the last five years, do you have examples of those being replicated in other regions, whether in Australia or overseas? Um, so one, one example, um, we, during the, the work on turtles, we, we were trying to find, I guess, more humane, more ethical ways of, of handling the turtles. So we, we decided to do the, the nail clipping as a, as a test to try and get away from sort of things like biopsies and, and needles, which are a little bit more uncomfortable, a little bit more invasive. And um, turns out that that, that worked really well. Um, it surprised me. No, no one had ever tried that before. It worked really well. And so now um, DBCA have a turtle program. They're, they're picking up and testing the method. And um, we've actually just in the process of publishing that particular bit of information so that uh, turtle folk around the world can, can try it. And um, hopefully we, um, we can make a small difference there. Did Damo or, or Rich, did you want to add to add to that? And while you're, while you're adding to that, you can answer Emma's question, which has just come in about the most surprising findings. Rock, paper, scissors. Richard, you're unmuted. Um, sorry, what was, the, what was the first question? <laughs> um, what examples of work that we've done that might have been picked up by others elsewhere? Hmm. Um, and if you want to dodge that one, there's always Emma's question to focus on, which just came in. I think I might. Uh, well, I mean, we've done a bit. we've done a lot of innovative stuff. Um, you know, we've trialled some different toad tags, um, and the, the toad tags on the whale sharks were sort of revolutionary, in giving us temperature and depth data, um, and the fact that we're able to get four of those tags back after up to 12 months or 11 months um, attachment times um, provided us with some really unique data um, on the kind of the detailed diving behavior and movement patterns of whale sharks that we, we hadn't seen before. Um, so we got some, some really fine scale data. The satellite tags collect 
temperature and depth every 10 seconds, um, as well as the obviously the satellite locations when they're at the surface. So merging that data together has given us a really fine scale picture of, of what whale sharks are doing and how they utilize the water column as they, as they move um, between places as far afield as, as Java um, and the Rolly Shoals and Ashmore Reef. Um, and I think there was another question there about the whale shark in Weeper. Um, how will we know? So we, we were fortunate enough to have a, a colleague up there who's trained um, in taking biopsy samples. So we got permission from Queensland Parks and Wildlife while the whale shark was still alive and healthy um, to get a, a tissue sample. And so that genetic sample can be matched with the, the existing samples that we've got. So if it's an animal that we've sampled before, it'll be really easy to, to, to identify it. If it's not one that we've sampled before, um, but it's say shares a parent or a brother or a sister with one of the animals that we have got, then that'll, I guess, indicate where it's come from. Um, there's been a number of animals or species that turn up in, in the Gulf of Carpentaria, things like black marlin um, and, and orcas that are assumed while well, the black marlin have been proved to come from Western Australia, but also from genetics. Whale shark genetics are a bit tricky to, to see if they've come from, from the East Coast or the West Coast because they're all sort of one big population from a genetic perspective. Cool, Stamo. And if you want, uh, yeah, I'll probably just add, you know, whilst we certainly can't claim to have um, pioneered that structure from motion photogrammetry technology, um, the paper that Anna Creswell just got out looking at coral growth is one of the first to extract um, that level of data from those three-dimensional uh, habitat maps. And, you know, that's something that we're going to just increasingly see used, you know, around the world. Um, you know, not just in shallow habitats, but deep habitats and, you know, the, the ability to extract useful data from um, that imagery is going to increase rapidly. And so, you know, whilst, whilst what we're doing now, you know, we feel quite happy with um, in a very short space of time, that's going to be, uh, that's going to look very clunky. Um, so that's a good example, I think, of something that we've done that, you know, we are going to see used a lot more um, increasingly and and perhaps to address the uh, the other question there which was what questions do we consider most important I just lost it what kind of questions are most important pertinent for further research I think um, one of the things that's become apparent is you know our estimates of reef growth uh, incredibly variable and we really need to tighten up um, both our predictions, for example, of sea level rise, so whether that could be through downscale predictions um, in combination with our predictions of reef growth. So um, that's something that we have begun working on and, uh, yeah, we, we hope to continue to do because we think that's really quite important. Um, you know, it's, it is a little bit scary when you have a look at the current RCP uh, 4.5 or higher predictions for sea level rise. Um, you know, if, if the reef actually can't keep pace with that level of sea level rise, we will see quite dramatic changes in the, in the coastline. Thanks, Damo. I might, I might have a, a little go at that uh, question from Ember as well. Most surprising findings, I guess, for me was really how restricted the movement of even large turtles is uh, outside outside mating movements. Um, we we, we kind of had a hunch that they don't go too far, but, but in Mangrove Bay, um, they really, really um, don't go far at all, you know, spending a whole year in, in a radius of, of just a, you know, a few hundred metres. And then what, what kind of questions are, are we going to look at in the future? Well, I guess the big unanswered question is, is how many turtles are there and, and what's the trend? Um, we, we don't know. We need, to, we need to get good estimates of how many there are before we can actually start um, calculating things like trend and figuring out whether it's going up or down. So that's gonna be a big one for us to, to try and get a handle on. And then in the meantime, 
I see Richard's multitasking and he's he's answering the, the questions via chat. So nice work about the the whale sharks going to, to Weeper and um, I hadn't heard about about that one either. Apparently they they weren't aware of the travel restrictions. Um, there's one question coming in on the Q and A also for you, Rich. Did you see that one about uh, the photos of the the alleged whale shark uh, mating event? You're on mute. Yeah. Am I? Okay. Not anymore. Um, no. What was the question? Uh, the question from, from Steph, did the photographs of the whale shark attempted mating event at Ningaloo shed any light on the mystery as to where whale sharks mate or reproduce or will it be treated as an anomaly? Yeah, so good question, Steph. Um, unfortunately, so we, we, were, we were fortunate that we were in the water with the, the shark at the time, at the big male, and that's a shark that we've sampled in the past. Um, and we also got photos from industry of the female shark based on images that the pilot Tiff took from the air. We were able to identify that shark. So it was a female, but she was about five and a half metres long, which is probably about at least 10 to 15 years away from being mature. So while her attentions from the, the male um, looked spectacular, they certainly uh, were not well received by the female. She wanted to get the heck out of there. Um, and I mean, it's interesting from the perspective that I guess males will attempt to mate with females that aren't receptive, um, but it doesn't really shed any light on where they where they mate. Um, all it all it tells us is that the, the I guess the sexually mature males at Ningaloo, which the, that big boy was, um, will will attempt to mate with females, um, and that's not too surprising given how uncommon you know, adult females are at Ningaloo. I think we've only seen two in the 270 sharks that we've, that we've identified. Um, and telling a, a mature female shark is tricky because unlike males, their, their reproductive organs are inside. So we're basically just going from a, a published literature um, sort of length at maturity. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question, but if it doesn't, ask another one. All right, thanks, Rich. Um, so I have not seen any other questions. I hope I haven't missed any. Um, well, well, maybe you're thinking of last questions to add. Uh, a, a shout out to to Jess, who um, Michelle said through text that Jess uh, found found that turtle tag. So so Jess, just for you. Uh, I'm going to show, here we go, share my screen again, and that uh, hopefully you can see, if I close down my items, you can see there, there we go, there's some of the information that uh, Rich extracted from the tag, so uh, a bit of, bit of information about uh, how it went from nice and warm in, in Mangrove Bay and, and then into a, a fairly cool 19 degree gulf uh, in, in the, just the space of a week and then over over a period the gulf, watching the gulf warm up. So that was just, I guess, a, a little snapshot of some, some of the information that we've been able to find out about. Thanks to you, Jess. Um, so just opening up. Any other questions? One for you, Rich, from Emily. You see that one? Broom shark sighted recently. Yeah, thanks, Sam. I think it just goes to show, you know, how opportunistic whale sharks are in terms of food resources. Um, so you've got, you know, footage from, from the Gulf of Carpentera of whale sharks in as water is as shallow as, as what that broom shark was in, feeding on little suggested prawns, um, which form really dense aggregations in the Gulf in the shallows. Um, and, you know, same sort of spectacular footage of a six or seven metre shark 
um, literally beaching itself on the beach, trying to trying to gorge itself on these prawns. Um, so yeah, there's a lot that we you know we still don't understand, um, and there's no doubt that you know whale sharks and manta rays are keyed into some of these sort of major biological events where there's you know lots of food concentrated um, in specific areas, um, and you know the tags just don't stay on for long enough and don't provide us with the fine scale um, sort of data for the entire track um, unless we get them back. So there's a lot that remains a mystery about, about what they're doing, where they go, what they feed on, um, and you know, the sorts of environments that they're going into. All right, cool, thanks Rich. And our last question comes through, what happened to the loggerhead from South Africa? Um, that's in reference to some news that uh, I think ooh, we're, we're weeks or maybe a couple of months of a, of a loggerhead turtle who did a, a cross Indian Ocean migration, and the answer is um, I don't know. Um, it got it was getting pretty close to to Western Australia, and I haven't had any news since. So I will try and find out, and I'll let you know. Um, but with that, and since I don't see any other questions coming in, um, I'm going to hand over to Brian. So all that remains for me is, is just to say thank you all uh, on behalf of the, of the whole Ningaloo Outlook team. Thanks to everyone in Exmouth, you rock. Um, we, when are you coming back? Well, as soon as, as, far, as far as I'm concerned, after seeing those pictures again, as soon as, soon as I possibly can. Um, normally we should have been there this, this May. Um, I'm watching those travel restrictions. I'm, I'm pretty keen to, to come up, um, even if it's just for a, for a mooch around and, and just catch up with people. Um, but stay tuned. We're, we're watching the news. So thanks all. Um, I'm going to hand over to Brian now, Brian. Hey, thanks, Matt. I certainly agree with you regarding um, watching those travel restrictions and trying to get up there as soon as possible. But look, thanks everybody for dialing into the this uh, Winneba. Um, I certainly hope you're all uh, doing well at the moment. Um, as you'd be aware, um, an important part of the Ningaloo Outlook project has been around communicating the results of the research and communi communicating this information with within the XMath community and also within the scientific community. Being um, the fifth year of the Nigloo Outlook program, it was a strong objective of both CSIRO and BHP to still make this uh, communication happen. Um, as you've been um, our partners in watching the results of this research and participating in this research over this, uh, this five year period. So it's really important that this, uh, this happen. So like so many at, at the moment, we've had to adapt in the way we meet and the way we communicate. So I'm glad we're able to get together um, and certainly interested in the feedback and uh, in uh, how this uh, winner bar actually uh, went. I certainly found it uh, really quite an, uh, an, an interesting and, and valuable uh, approach in, and the way that we've communicated. Certainly at each one of these engagements over the years, I'm continually impressed and inspired by the findings and also the quality of the research and the dedication of the, the research team at the CSIRO. Um, fantastic group of people to work with and certainly um, been, been an honour. Um, it's amazing how the technology has progressed um, um, in how the research is conducted and also what we've learnt um, over this continuous period of research in what is a very important region. Then of course there's the, uh, the passion and interest that we see from the community, both in the, the uh, participation in the research program and learning about the, the, the results of that research and, and both of those two things uh, combined uh, make this particular program um, so very important to, to, to BHP. So thanks to Matt, Richard and Damon for their presentations. I'd like to thank the, the community, for Exmouth community for uh, participating in this session tonight. Um, as I said, I think it's been a really great session. So normally we'd have drinks and some food, some good conversation after it. That's the bit that's unfortunately missing tonight. Um, it's something that somehow we'll have to schedule for in the future um, when we all ultimately get a bit more mobile and ideally the world is in a better place. So hopefully that's not too far away and I'll certainly look forward to doing that. So thanks everybody for making this happen. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for, to the team.
Thanks, Brian. Thanks, everyone. Um, this was a first for us, so don't be shy. Let us, you know, contact us. Let us know how it went from your side. Um, thank you and goodbye. <clears throat> thanks, all. See you, thanks. Everyone. Hey, Rich, can you hear me? You're muted. Oh, that's better. Am I? I think Mark keeps muting me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, too. Hey, have any of the sharks um, exhibited like a repeated movement pattern? Um, we've only tagged one one shark twice um, that we know of. Obviously, now that we identify them all, um, sort of religiously, we can we can track them. Um, and that was a big female called Danny. Um, and unfortunately, the first time we tagged her, the tag only stayed on for about six weeks. Um, but yeah, pretty much did the same thing in that period. Um, and then that shark went up all the way up sort of towards Roti, um, probably the furthest northwest that, that or northeast that any of the sharks went. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, we just didn't get that sort of prolonged period. But yeah, that's one of the, I guess, you know, given that their movement appears to be so directional and so kind of purposeful, um, why do they go to the same place? Or do they go to the same place year after year? Are they keyed into to events that happen that they've learned over time? Do they go to the same places maybe that their parents went to? Or yeah, that's one of the kind of key questions that we, we don't really know. Um, or is there, you know, just sort of random variability that they go to different places from year to year? Um, they do yo-yo around a lot. You know, sharks will go to, go to Ashmore and then come back and then go back to Ashmore. So they're obviously searching for food, but if, if, if we don't know if that's part of a kind of learned pattern or, or if they might do something different the next year because there's just different oceanographic conditions or different currents. Cool. Good job, guys. Yes, well done. Oh, that was... Uh, yep. I'd like Thank to you, see everyone. how to put a background on. <laughs> Yeah, we've got some learning to do, Damien. We do, yes. We're the novices. I see even Brian, you know, beat us to the background well and truly. That's a nice one. Yeah, I had Pete Barnes texting me during the uh, during the presentation going, are you, are you in a prison? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, I can hear everybody well and you can still see everyone well. Yeah. No, uh, well, well, thanks very much, Mark, for for, for sorting yeah. it out. Yeah, no worries at all. That was thanks, great. Mark. Well done. Yeah, much appreciate it. I'm still online. So thanks to Joe as well for help. And yeah, yeah, thanks, Joe, if you're there. I didn't know that she's still there. No, I think I think she's gone. Yeah. I, I thought the chat process went pretty well. Yeah, it works pretty well. I think. Oh. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's more like it, mate. There you go, you can see a vacuum now. <laughs> <laughs> Behind the scenes. All right, I'll, um, I've got that recording, I'll shut it off now and it'll probably take an hour or so to render, so. All right, cool. Thanks, Thanks for your help, Mark. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks very Jim, much. So I'll, I'll talk to you on Monday. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Good All job, right. guys. Catch up. Bye. Bye.